I would like to welcome all of you to this session on emergency communications. In this session, we will be talking about disaster communications. In your CERT training, one of the things that was really emphasized was the fact that in any large-scale disaster, such as a large earthquake, one of the first things that will be damaged will be the phone system. And this is really tragic because for most people, the only access they have to emergency services is by dialing 911. When the phone system fails, they will be cut off from emergency services. Now, as CERT team members, you can be taking on a lot of the roles that traditionally the fire department uh, takes on. So, loss of communication is going to be a disaster not only for people to contact and request help, but also communication within your group. Cell phones will also fail, and a lot of teams will be relying on radios instead of cell phones. So, what we're going to be talking about are some issues of how do you work as a team using radios? How, what are the basics? Um, how do you get a lot of information to a lot of people? How do you prioritize that information? And how do you work as a team, especially when using the radios? My name is Howard Zolte, and one of the things that we try to do in this session is put together some of the best practices from groups that have a lot of experience in emergencies and disaster communications. This comes from Aries Races, which is the Amateur Radio Emergency Services Group. Um, also, REACT which is another emergency service group that uh, stands for Radio Emergency Associated Communication Teams. I'm also vice president of a local team, so I bring a lot of experience from that. I'm also a Santa Clara County emergency communicator, so I work with multiple cities. And also, I'm a CERT team member in multiple cities, so a lot of the best practices will be incorporated into this presentation. All the basic concepts of emergency communication are actually really simple. In fact, most of you already know this stuff. You learned it on the first day of kindergarten. Let me give you an example. There is a uh, disaster communication term called network control station or network control operator, which you'll hear quite frequently um, in disaster communication. It sounds complicated. <laughs> but actually, it's a very, very simple concept. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, every year, around August or September, hundreds of thousands of little kids all go off to their first day of kindergarten. And most of them have never been in school before, so this is their first experience at school. And they're all excited, and it's going to be fun, because in the kindergarten classroom, there are lots of toys, they get to sing songs, they get to play games, they get to learn new things. And all these children come into the classroom, and they're all talking, and they're all having fun. But there's a problem. Everyone is talking at once. And this is a problem for the kindergarten teacher. So one of the first things that the kindergarten teacher will do is tell the kids, okay, you all can talk, but we need only one person to talk at a time. And here's what you do. If you want to talk, please raise your hand, and I will call on you, and you will get to talk, and then the next person can raise their hand, and they can talk, and we'll all get a chance to talk. How's that sound? Well, that's basically what a network control station or network control operator does. They play the role of kindergarten teacher. Now, after disaster, there are going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of emergencies, and everyone is going to want to talk at the same time on the radio. And if that happens, it's going to be a mess. Okay? So, what does the uh, network control operator do? They basically say, okay, you talk now. Okay, now it's your turn. You talk. And they're also uh, trying to figure out what the highest priority message is, okay? Because some emergencies are more important than others. And it's actually the same thing in the kindergarten classroom. For example, to a child, every message, every communication is urgent, okay? It's high priority, okay? Same thing in disaster. Everyone thinks their message is high priority. In the kindergarten classroom, you have two kids. One, both raise their hand. Um, one is jumping up and down, saying, Teacher, teacher, I have to go to the bathroom. The other one uh, is saying, Teacher, it was my birthday yesterday. I got a new toy. Do you want to come and see it? Well, we both know um, 
which message is higher priority. And if you don't, um, I hope you have a mop and pail to clean up uh, the, uh, the priority. But the concept is basically the same. Um, when everyone, would ta everyone wants to talk at once, it's very, very important that we get the most critical emergency information through at the earliest point. Okay? So <laughs> you basically learned two of the most critical terms, network control station and message prioritization. Okay? It's actually really simple. Another really important concept that you've already learned way back in kindergarten is working as a team. And that is absolutely critical in disaster or emergency communications. After disaster, there are going to be many, many more emergencies and problems than you have people to handle. And they're also going to be over a wide area. So radio communication is going to be essential to working as a team, especially over a wide area. Now the question is, how do we get practice in disaster communications? Disasters are unplanned, they happen infrequently, but we have to be prepared for them. One of the ways we do get practice is by helping out in the community and very, at very large events. For example, any event that has anywhere between 50,000 people to a quarter million people over a weekend is definitely going to have problems. And one of the things you also need to practice is working effectively not only within your team but with other teams and working with the police and fire department and all the other teams that might be involved with that. So working at community events is a very good way to actually get practice both in teamwork and working with other groups and communications. One of the biggest problems in large-scale emergencies or disasters is the fact that multiple different emergency groups all need to talk to each other, but they can't. Their equipment is incompatible, they're on different frequencies, they have a lot of different uh, communication issues between groups. That is a real problem, and in disasters, it's essential that everyone be able to talk to each other. Well, one of the ways we get around that is the concept of a relay. Now, you actually learned that concept way back in kindergarten in a concept called a relay race. Now, a relay race is a really simple, um, uh, fun event for kids, and it's based on the concept that if you can't run the entire race yourself, what you can do is have a team and people can pass the baton. You run uh, a quarter of the distance and then pass the baton to the next person and they run part of it and then they run part of it. Well, the same thing happens in disaster communications. We may not be able to talk directly to another emergency services group, but what we can do is act like a relay. And in this picture, I'm the one taking the picture, um, but my role actually is to be the relay uh, for emergency communications. Now, at any large event, you need to be able to contact the police and fire services very quickly. You need to work as a team. The problem is that we all have different radios. Sometimes what we do is we give the uh, police commander or fire, uh, ca fire um, commander one of our radios and that way we have a way to uh, talk to each other. It's very rare that the police will give us one of their radios. Um, and that's one way to bridge a communication gap. You know, we all share a similar radio uh, frequency. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, in this case, uh, the police didn't want uh, one of our radios. So what my position was, I was to stand uh, by the police and um, if we needed any police assistance, I could very easily tell the police uh, what the situation was from the messages coming across my radio. And the other thing is, in addition to the police, um, you also see uh, uh, the two people at in front of the car. They actually are working for the event, and they have access to the PA system. So the concept of a relay in emergency and disaster communication says that you may not be able to talk directly to another emergency services group that you need to talk to, but what you can do is have a person positioned near one of those groups so you can relay the me critical message and get help 
to the place where you need it the most, okay? So that's the concept of a relay, and that's very essential to disaster communications because remember, most emergency groups cannot talk to each other, and you have to relay messages between groups. So now that you have a radio, what do you do with that radio after the ground stops shaking and we've had a major earthquake? Well, the first thing you need to do is check on your own safety. Are you okay? Are you injured? That is your top priority, taking care of yourself. Your next priority is taking care of your family. Are they okay? Next priority, your house, your neighbors, what is directly around you. Only after you know that you're okay and the people immediately around you are safe, then are you ready to start helping the community. So the first thing you need to do, once you're sure that you're okay, turn on that radio and listen. There may already be emergency traffic going on there, so don't press the transmit button until you've already listened and know that, that channel is clear. The other thing to remember is that in an emergency, in a disaster, if you have a GMRS radio, you are supposed to have a license for this, but in an emergency situation, the federal government has an exception to that licensing requirement and is covered under FCC regulation 95.143. And the summary is that in a disaster, emergency situation, where there's a direct uh, risk to life, or property, a license is not required to discuss emergency communications, okay? So let's assume that everything is working with the radio. The first person on the radio becomes a net control operator. Now remember that's a fancy network, uh, radio network term, but what it actually means is you are the kindergarten teacher. You are listening for emergencies, you are writing them down, you are uh, trying to control the traffic on that uh, frequency. Now, when someone more qualified comes along, um, or the emergency operations center is staffed up and um, an established communication infrastructure is in place, you may be relieved of that net control operation. But remember, first person on the radio is a net control operator, gathering information and figuring out what's happening. Uh, what you may ask people to do is, who's out there? Please check in. Where are you at? What's happening in the community? What are the dangers? What are the problems? Start writing those things down. And if you have to write it down, because if you do not write it down, you will forget it. There will be many, many things happening. Things are only get worse in terms of reports of problems. I've been there in this situation. I always thought, you know, initially that I don't need to write it down, but I learned very quickly that unless you write it down, you will never catch up, okay? The other thing is you, you may be giving your uh, notes to someone else because you may have to go to a different situation, okay? Write it or you'll forget it. I mean, that's something very important to know. The uh, next most important thing is that when you're operating the radio, press that transmit button and then wait two seconds before talking. If you don't do that, it takes a tiny bit of time for that radio to power up. If you don't wait those two seconds, the first part of the communication will be clipped off. So very important. Press that button and then wait two seconds before talking. Now, in a disaster, in an emergency, we are all nervous. We all talk quickly. Slow down. Okay? Communication is not communication until the other end understands your message. Very, very important. It happens all the time. Remember this. Slow, clear communications. And the other important thing in operating the radio is hold it about one to two inches from your mouth. A lot of people make the mistake of holding it too far away and at that point, the conversation is very, very hard to hear. Most radios were designed with the microphone 
to be held about two inches. For official communication where something is going to be sent to the emergency operations center of the city, to the EOC, speak your message in five word groups. Remember, there is someone at the other end who is writing that down. Now, a lot of people forget this, and uh, early on, you know, I probably did the same thing. You know, I spoke a little too fast, and uh, my grouping was much larger than five words. I learned very quickly when I was at the other end at an emergency operations center having to copy that stuff down. <laughs> you learn why it's important, why it's very important to uh, slow down and group it in five words. Okay. And the most important thing is always think about safety. In disaster emergency situations, the situation is changing. It's dangerous. Things, there are problems that are appearing uh, when you least expect it. You need to keep everyone informed of any dangers. And you need to actually look at the situation. And it is more important to look around and take care of your own safety than to focus on that message because um, lots of problems happen very quickly. Disasters are dangerous situations. Always think safety. One of the most important terms that you'll be hearing over and over again in any disaster communications is the term Emergency Operations Center. More commonly, you will hear the abbreviation EOC. Now, that's actually a very simple concept. And what happens after disaster, in most cases, the infrastructure of a city is destroyed. The 911 system is gone. Telephones are gone. Um, communication out to uh, fire stations is disrupted. Uh, police have a hard time communicating. So what happens is the city very quickly establishes an emergency operations center where all the top level people, the fire chief, the police chief, the public works department, all the people that need to work together as a team to resolve problems are located in a place called the Emergency Operations Center. Now, a lot of times it's a pre-established place, but you also have to remember that disasters destroy buildings. And a lot of times the Emergency Operations Center is wherever we can find a safe building and we can staff it with the right people. And the way we communicate with the Emergency Operations Center is usually via amateur radio. Uh, and that's the RACES team, the Emergency Communication Volunteer Team. Now what happens is that at the Emergency Operations Center, they very quickly need to know what is happening in the city, what is wrong, what, is the pro what are the problems, because they need to start requesting help from the county, the state, and the federal government, because disasters are overwhelming. We do not have the resources to help everyone. Help has to be coming from the outside. And at the same time, we have to be able to effectively organize our limited resources. And that happens at the top levels at the Emergency Operations Center. Now, the CERT teams are essential to this process because the CERT teams are in the community. They know what the problems are. They know where the fires are. They know where the, pro the disaster um, issues are, the medical problems. They need to gather that information and relay that to the Emergency Operations Center. Now, in most cases, the way it will work is CERT communications will be talking to the amateur radio, the RACES amateur radio operators, who then have staff in the Emergency Operations Center. They have staff that are volunteering and going to the hospitals and all the critical infrastructure. And it's a two-way process. The CERT teams feed the information up to the City Emergency Operations Center, and the Emergency Operations Center are going, people at that level are going to work really hard to try to get the resources to the uh, community and to the CERT teams. Um, so that term EOC, that is the communication point and the decision-making point for the city. 
and it's called EOC or Emergency Operations Center and you will hear that very frequently. In a disaster situation, you are going to be flooded with emergency messages. That's simply re the reality of disasters. And the way you deal with that is by prioritizing the messages. And almost every emergency communication group has a three-level grouping system. And some groups uh, have uh, the three categories of urgent, immediate, or informational. Others have the categories life-threatening, property-threatening, or routine. And others simply use a priority system of priority one, two, or three. No matter what system your group uses, it's important to make sure that the highest priority messages get through first, and that's how we save lives, or at least do the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. Sometimes people do not prioritize the messages and uh, bad things happen. If you look at the series of dots and dashes in the center of the screen, most of you don't understand Morse code, so uh, I'll let you know that that is one of the most historic disaster messages ever sent. And the first word is CQD. And at the time, that stood for Come Quick Disaster. That's really bad. The next uh, word is Titanic, and the next are a series of numbers. That's the location of the Titanic at the time of its distress signal. Now the question is, what happened on that day? Um, we all know that it struck the iceberg, but it never should have struck that iceberg. All throughout the night, ships were passing in that general direction sending messages out letting everyone know there's ice and icebergs in the area. The Titanic operator heard those messages, maybe even wrote them down, but he never gave those messages to the ship's captain. The high priority message never got through. Even worse, a short time before the Titanic hit the iceberg, there was another ship only a few miles away. The operator of the ship had been working 16 hours, a long shift, he was tired, and he sent a message out that said, we're stopping for the night due to the ice and icebergs in the area. The ships were so close together that when the Titanic operator heard that message, it was so loud that it blasted his ears. He was obviously upset, and he sent back to the uh, to the operator on the Californian, just a few miles away. Shut up, shut up, keep out, keep out. I'm working Cape Race, which means he was sending important messages for his first class passengers, and that was his top priority. Well, mistakes were made on both sides, and it was all about message prioritization. The Californian operator should have put a high priority code in front of his message, and the code at that time was MSC, stood for message of ship's captain. That was like an urgent message. He did not do that, so he failed in message prioritization. The Titanic operator should have listened to the message rather than just telling the uh, California operator to uh, be quiet. Now, the California operator was tired. He was just told to uh, shut up, uh, so he turned off his radio and went to sleep after his 16 hour shift. A few minutes later, the Titanic struck the iceberg and sent that historic distress call. No one on the Californian, which is only a few miles away, heard that message due to message prioritization errors. That distress signal was heard hundreds of miles away. Ships from hundreds of miles away raced to help the Titanic survivors, but they arrived too late. So keep in mind, when I tell you that message prioritization is very, very important, it really is, okay? And you may be in situations where someone on the radio channel is saying what may seem like a low-priority message, 
listen carefully and make sure that it really is low priority. There's a situation where I almost made that same mistake. Um, I had a high priority message. Someone on another radio, on another frequency, the radios were close together, transmitted, it blasted my ears. You know, I was at noticeably well set, but I remember the situation and listen carefully to the message. It turned out it was a very high priority message, much higher than mine, and it related to safety issues that need to be dealt with uh, right away. So my advice is that you need to prioritize the traffic, but you also need to make sure that you listen carefully to what's going on to make sure that you don't cause other problems. So message prioritization is absolutely essential. There are some basic terms that you'll be hearing in disaster communications. Some of these you're, you already know, and some of these I've included because other teams across the country use them. And in large-scale disasters, you will be working with groups um, from all over, so you should be familiar with most of these terms. Uh, tactical calls actually are very simple. Um, let's say that you are assigned to be the communication person at the local hospital. Um, you may be assigned a tactical call city hospital and instead of everyone having to know your name and who's at the hospital they just address all messages as city hospital and you respond uh, to those messages and when you uh, initiate messages you will use that um, as your name uh, roll calls uh, that's very simple you know every child in school knows about roll calls and attendance. And the reason why it's important is that disasters are very dangerous and sometimes disaster workers get hurt on the job. And you need to make sure that everyone is okay. So once an hour or once every 15 minutes, or it depends on the situation, you will go through the list of all the people that you're responsible for and ask them to respond to their name. And they should answer. If they don't, there was a problem and you either need to figure out what the situation is, do you need to send someone to look for them, do you need to contact someone who's in the general location. Safety is absolutely essential, so roll call is something that you will always be using in disaster situations. Check-in. As soon as the disaster happens, people will be checking in. They will get on the radio, they will announce their presence, they will let people know what the situation is, and they will let the net control operator know that they are available to help, and that's called check-in. Um, there's also some legal issues about check-in because uh, a lot of safety coverage, a lot of insurance coverage happens from the moment you check in to when you check out. So there are legal issues about check-in. So um, make sure that everyone on your team has checked in. Uh, net control, we've already discussed that. That is uh, maintaining control over the uh, radio communication. And it's that kindergarten analogy that we uh, mentioned, uh, making sure that one person talks at a time and the most important information gets through. Um, the rest of the list are one-word terms because we need very efficient information, and these are responses to uh, things that you'll hear on the radio. When someone says over uh, after they speak, they are signaling that they have they are done talking, and it's your turn to talk. Okay, um, out means that they finished the message and they're really not expecting you to continue the conversation. Um, Acknowledge or Roger, uh, that you'll hear very frequently. When someone is talking to you and you want to let them know that you heard the message, but you're not saying, commenting on the message, you're not saying it's right or wrong, you're just uh, acknowledging you received the message, use the word acknowledge or Roger. You'll hear that very frequently. Um, we never use yes and no in radio communication or at least we shouldn't. Uh, the reason for that is a lot of times the radios are far apart, there's lots of noise on the channel, and short yes and no answers are very hard to hear. A lot of times they get uh, misinterpreted because of the noise on the channel. So we say affirmative for yes and negative for no. Um, 
if someone wants to know uh, whether the message is correct or not, uh, we may respond with the single words correct or wrong, uh, if it isn't. Um, if someone is talking on the radio and you have more information than they, than they do, a lot of times after they've completed the message, you may want to get on the channel and say correction if you need to correct that message that they just sent out. Uh, because in disasters, a lot of times um, wrong information gets out and that needs to be corrected very quickly. If someone is talking on the radio and they're not sure about something, um, you may interrupt and um, with a simple word info and that person may say go ahead info and you'll give them more details. Um, sometimes people will be on the radio and they will ask a question and uh, if you know the answer, you don't want to tie up the radio channel with a wrong answer. You just simply say the word answer and then that person will say go ahead answer when they're ready to uh, listen or copy it down. Um, Sometimes people will um, say something across the radio that is not clear or needs additional information. At that point, if you, ha if you have a question, what you should do is simply state the word query or question when they stop talking. At that point, the person will uh, respond and say, go ahead, question. At that point, you'll give your call sign or name and who you're talking to. Um, a lot of times disaster situations change and things get worse so there may be low priority messages going across at a certain point if an emergency situation happens we need to interrupt someone as soon as there's a gap in the communication there are three common ways we do that we either say the word break that's very common we say prior priority or we say emergency so we very quickly I get in there and tell someone that we have a higher priority message. We have an emergency message, a priority message uh, at that point. At that point, uh, uh, the net control operator should say, go ahead, emergency, go ahead, priority. Um, so that's how we um, get the highest priority messages in. So these are some common terms that you'll be hearing and even though we don't use all of them in our situations, you should know them for when you're dealing with people uh, coming from other areas. One of the real challenges in disaster communications is that a lot of times we have people spread over a wide area and sometimes radio communication is really difficult to some of the uh, people very far away. And the other thing is that we need to request help, usually from other cities. Uh, so the ability to communicate over longer distances is uh, challenging. Now one thing to remember is that if we are using FRS, GMRS radios for communication, they operate in a band called UHF, Ultra High Frequency Band, and there are several characteristics of this uh, range of frequencies that we need to understand um, to enable longer distances. The first thing is that you can increase distance by going to higher power levels. The challenge is that it's an exponential function, so even if you um, increase your power by a factor of 10, you're not going to get a significant distance um, increase. Um, usually people report somewhere between about oh, maybe 20% to 30% of what they feel it should be at uh, power times 10. What you really get in terms of distance advantage is the effect of increasing your height. If you can get higher up off the ground you will significantly increase your distance. There are a couple of reasons for that. First, lower on close to the ground, you've got buildings, you've got trees, you've got cars, you've got objects, okay? All of those things between you and the person you try and talk to, those absorb some of the radio energy. So um, you need to get up higher above that stuff. Second is the curvature of the earth. Um, over a larger distance, you lose a lot that goes um, along the path uh, through the earth, okay? So higher up, 
you get more of a direct um, line of sight to the um, a receiver station. Now, what does that mean? If you can go higher up in a building, and let's say the building is still standing, if you can go to usually like a second or third floor, people report that in the UHF band, they typically double their communication distance. Um, go up to maybe about the 10th floor of a building or something to that effect, and you may be able to triple your distance. So height above ground is actually more important than power levels. The other trade-off is that power levels, you increase the power level, but you're not getting that same amount of distance out of it. Double your power, and you don't double the distance. But what you do end up doing is running your batteries down twice as fast. Okay, And in a disaster, electricity is usually not available, so you need to preserve your batteries. So the point is that look for ways to raise your antennas, your radios, uh, get up high, okay, as long as that's safe. And um, some of the radios we use, especially um, in the emergency services uh, organizations, we have external antennas, and we raise them up high. We put them up um, on top of flagpoles. We raise them up in trees. That's how we get the height. So um, remember, height will help you with distance. The other thing is, remember that concept of a radio relay? like a relay race in school, if you need to communicate over a larger distance, you may only be only able to reach someone halfway of that distance. Why not put someone there to receive your transmission, listen to it, and then retransmit it on to the destination? And that's called a relay. So you're able to do large communication radio distances by using several people positioned along the path, just like a relay race um, that you may be familiar with in school. The more common thing we do for the more advanced system is we use what's called repeaters, radio repeater systems. And in that case, what we end up doing is we put a uh, radio receiver transmitter up on the top of, of a mountain or at the top of a big building or the top of a tower. And what that does is the higher power and the higher height lets us communicate over a larger distance. It's actually a combination of a relay, um, and usually the uh, repeaters have higher power, and more importantly, a significant height advantage. And we have repeaters um, that are able to cover most of the um, Bay Area. After a large-scale disaster, we are going to have lots of problems more problems than we have resources to deal with. The CERT teams are going to be essential to helping the community. And unfortunately, there are not a lot of CERT members in most cities. So we're going to have to work together. We're going to have to work effectively. And communication is what ties it all together so we can do the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Uh, on the website, we have other presentations on emergency communication topics. Please close the window and uh, look at some of the other presentations. Thank you very much.